Stephen Conroy there. Now, the other issue causing a big stir is the government's planned changes to the Racial Discrimination Act. The Attorney General, George Brandis, wants to change the language of the Act, removing words which he believes restrict the right to free speech. He's told the Senate Australians should have the right to offend each other. People do have a right to be bigots, you know. In a free country, people do have rights to say things that other people find offensive or insulting or bigoted. So, do we have rights to be bigots under the changes to this legislation? With us now is Hugh de Kretzer from the Human Rights Law Centre and Simon Brini from the Institute of Public Affairs, Simons in Canberra. Good morning to both of you. Good morning, Michael. Good morning. Simon, can we start with you? Why should we have the rights in George, Bra the right in George Brandis's words to be bigots in Australia? Uh, this is more about freedom of speech. Um, freedom of speech is a fundamental principle. Uh, it underlines how important it is to have a liberal democracy in which people are able to express their views. Um, and the fundamental question here is one of freedom of conscience, for people to be able to think what they like and say, say what they like. Um, and these moves, the, the decision that was made today by the, yesterday by the Attorney General is a significant step forward on freedom of speech. Uh, but, but to be bigoted at the same time, it, it, does that sit right with you? Well, people are able to express themselves whether or not other people like it. Uh, as the Attorney-General has said, uh, freedom of speech really does mean the ability for you to be able to say things that other people do find offensive and derogatory and bigoted. Um, we might not like it and we might say, we, we might use our freedom of speech to decide we're going to say to these people who are bigoted what you're saying is inappropriate and what you're saying is not right. Uh, but that is what freedom of speech is about. We, you've got, on the one hand, people saying bigoted things, and on the other hand, you've got the response to that. Hugh de Kretzer, what, what do you make of those arguments? Um, well, it's pretty unfortunate that we have our Attorney-General in Australia defending the right to uh, express bigotry. It's uh, really problematic leadership from the government, and that has uh, translated into proposed reforms to our racial vilification laws, which essentially licence uh, the uh, use of racial vilification. We know that free speech is a critically important right, uh, but we also know that it's limited. If you, ha you can uh, lawfully limit free speech if you have a, have a very good reason to, and we do it in a whole range of areas. I can't make threats to kill, I can't defame. Uh, the censorship laws, there's misleading and deceptive conduct laws, and uh, under international human rights law, it's very accepted that uh, it is legitimate for governments to pass laws that uh, attempt to address the harm that flows from some forms of free speech. So what it's about doing is balancing the important right of free speech against the important rights of vulnerable ethnic minorities to be free from racial vilification. And these laws get that balance, uh, these proposed laws uh, get that balance uh, uh, horrendously wrong. And what, what do you make of George Brandis's argument that it's not the government's role to stop people's feelings being hurt? Uh, so, I mean, the, the current laws have been operating uh, reasonably effectively for almost 20 years now. Uh, courts have interpreted them very sensibly. They've said uh, this only deals with serious instances of uh, racial vilification, so it's not about mere slights, it's not about uh, mere hurt feelings, so it must be serious. Uh, so we can have a debate around the words offend, insult, uh, humiliate or intimidate, but what these proposed changes do is drastically narrow the scope of these laws. The main problem we have with them is this extremely broad exemption that says uh, these laws, it's, it's the, the, the Prime Minister and the Attorney General are essentially saying we care about protecting the community from racist hate speech. P.S. There's a huge exemption for public discussion on uh, cultural, uh, social, uh, religious, economic, political matters uh, where uh, it will effectively mean that the laws uh, don't apply in private, don't apply in public discussion, so it's unclear where they actually will apply. And I want to pick up on that exemption with both of you shortly, but back to you, Sam, and just getting to the issue that uh, Hugh has ra uh, raised and also raised by the likes of Colin Rubenstein from the Australia, Israel and Jewish Affairs Council, both arguing the Act has worked very well for two decades now. Why can you distill it in a couple of sentences? Why should this Act be changed? I, I, I disagree. I don't think this Act has worked well for two decades. Um, at the end of 2011, we saw an Australian journalist dragged through the courts under this legislation. Um, he was found to have breached Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act for an opinion piece that he had written on a matter of public policy. Now, I don't think it's appropriate, and I think the majority of Australians agree, that it's inappropriate for an Australian journalist to be dragged through the courts for something that they write. Simon, as you as know, he, 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 he was found guilty of getting his facts wrong, and you're referring to Andrew Bolt there, of course. He was I found, am referring, he, uh, Justice I am referring to Andrew Bolt. Justice Bromberg found Andrew Bolt got fundamental facts wrong. Well, he was found to have breached Section 18C. Now, 
Uh, the first hurdle in Section 18C is whether you've offended, insulted, humiliated or intimidated a person on the basis of their race. Um, that was the provision which Andrew Bolt had breached. Um, there's, a, there's a separate but, yeah, debate but, about sorry, what the sorry exemptions Sorry to keep interrupting, were. Yeah, and, and we'll get to the exemptions which have been changed and, and widened in many people's eyes as well. He was only found to have breached the Act, Simon, because he got those fundamental facts wrong when he made those allegations against uh, the, the Aborigines involved. No, what, what the decision was was that the exemptions didn't apply. So when, when uh, Andrew Bolt uh, decided that, well, what I've said might have breached Section 18C, but let's go for some of the exemption, exemptions that are available under Section 18D, the judge said, for a number of reasons, those exemptions don't apply. Now, I think it's a great thing that we've extended the exemptions out. We've made them much, much broader under this exposure draft. Uh, we now have an exceptionally broad range of defences and I think it's appropriate given the, the uh, possibility for the vilification provision in particular in the draft bill uh, to be a, a, a catch-all for the kinds of conduct that we've seen under Section 18C already. Do you, uh, what do you say to the criticism, and, and Hugh was touching on that a moment ago, that this uh, exemption, and I'm quoting from the draft exposure, uh, exempting you from this uh, act uh, if you're engaging in a public discussion on any political, social, cultural, religious, artistic, academic or scientific matter. What do you say that the, to the criticism that is just way too broad an exemption? Uh, look, I'd go even further than this, to be honest. I think uh, the government has done the right thing in, in moving in this direction, but I would have scrapped the whole provision. There are any number of laws that protect people from racial abuse. Hugh, Hugh listed a few of those. Threats of violence, either, either intimidation either to you, your family or your property. Uh, there's any number of harassment laws, there's defamation. There are hundreds of protections in both state and Commonwealth level for racial abuse. Section 18C goes much further than that. It doesn't just protect communities from racial abuse, it is inf an infringement on freedom of speech. Now there are other laws that deal with this kind of conduct, with conduct that is unacceptable in ways that don't infringe that fundamental right. And Hugh de Kretzer, you touched on this earlier, can you expand on that? Uh, do you believe there's just too much wriggle room in this exemption here? Um, well, I think we need to look at the Bolt case and say why, why wasn't Bolt able to say what he was able to, why did he breach section 18C? It's because he couldn't uh, rely on the defence in 18D. So the judge in his case was very clear to say nothing in my judgment should be taken to mean we can't have a public discussion about whether or not someone is genuinely of a particular racial identity and challenge that uh, genuineness and that's what Bolt was doing in his articles. Where Bolt got it wrong was he made multiple errors of fact, distortions of the truth, uh, provocative inflammatory language, uh, what the judge in one case described as a gross error. So if he had done his journalism properly, if he had been accurate, uh, it's likely like Pauline Hanson in a book that she said um, was uh, average were unfairly getting treatment for uh, preferential benefits from the government, that was actually found to fall into these existing free speech safeguards. But you have to do it reasonably, you have to do it in good faith. Andrew Bolt didn't do that. These new exemptions uh, remove those good faith requirements, remove that reasonable requirement, uh, expand uh, the exemption. And one thing on which uh, Simon and I will agree, I saw um, the IPO's media release and, and comments from Chris Berg, it is effectively or 95 per cent of a repeal of, this leg of these mm -hmm. laws. So uh, it's effectively rendered the racial vilification provisions in the federal law uh, effectively useless. Uh, it's an exposure draft, so it's important that we have a public discussion around this and people who are concerned about it. Uh, my concern is that the voices of the uh, communities that bear the brunt of racism aren't getting the airtime in this debate that they deserve. So the Jewish community, the Aboriginal community, ethnic communities across Australia are extremely concerned about these changes and we need to listen carefully to what they have to say and they want strong and effective racial vilification laws. And on that point, Simon Breeding, what, what do you say to that argument that uh, people like Colin Rubenstein representing the Jewish community, others representing the Arab community in Australia, the Chinese community in Australia, are almost pleading with the government, don't do this. Um, I, I think the way to deal with, with, uh, with racism more broadly uh, is to talk through these issues and have a public discussion. One of the problems with Section 18C is that it doesn't allow for that discussion to happen. Um, I think it's really important that, in fact, it's more important on 
more controversial issues that we're able to discuss them than less controversial issues. So often when we pass laws like Section 18C which restrict controversial debate, we're not allowing for the expression of those ideas that will mean that racism will be defeated. Racism won't be defeated through us passing laws through the Parliament, it will be defeated through public discussion and changing people's minds. And should the Attorney General take on board, uh, you say it's all about uh, getting out there and consulting, take on board these views from those groups uh, as he looks at po possibly changing this legislation again? Uh, well, I'd love for him to take on my view, and my view is that Section 18C has to be repealed in its entirety. And uh, Hugh Kretzer, the final word to you. What, what, what do you hope comes out of this consultation process? We, we hope that um, there is clarity about what these proposed changes will do, which is effectively entirely repeal racial vilification protections at, at the federal level. It's astonishing that the uh, Attorney and the Prime Minister claim they're actually um, expanding the protection against racist speech. Uh, it's, it's dramatically winding it back. If they're open uh, and uh, approach this consultation in good faith, there is an opportunity for the community to have a say and say, we want strong and effective racial vilification laws. And we hope that the government listens to that and listens to some of their concerns from their own backbenchers and changes these laws, changes okay. these proposals. Terrific. Hugh DeCretzer and Simon Brini, thank you both for joining us this morning. Thanks, Raymond. Thanks, Hugh. Thanks, Simon.